So let's start with number one. Okay, so we got a hundred, hundred household neighborhood, each with a vacant lot that will be developed either as a house or an apartment. Each household is willing to pay $300 for the house rather than the apartment complex. The apartment builder has bid $100,000 for the lot compared with a bid of $86,000 for the house builder. Zoning for low density. Um, I can't remember who asked this. I think a couple of you wanted to review it, but what did you have for an answer? Or what did the author give us? Uh, efficient because 116,000 is greater than 100,000. Okay, so this one might be a little confusing. Um, you know, you guys don't deal with real estate development and stuff. So we have the issue in economics where the market system would kind of work itself out, right? But then the government steps in and says, well, let's have laws that says only houses can be by houses and factories by factories. So that's part of the zoning issue. And so zoning for low density, low density is keeping the houses rather than allowing apartment buildings. Do we get an efficient outcome from an economist standpoint? Does marginal benefit equal marginal cost or you know, is it working? And so here, we need to bring the dollars into it. So how do we know, where did the 116,000 come from, from the answer key? the 86 plus the 300 times 100 houses. Okay, so this part of it was that each household's willing to cough up 300 bucks to avoid having an apartment building in their neighborhood, right? They think, oh, that's gonna bring the druggies and the, and the riffraff and there's gonna be traffic and congestion and they'll probably th be throwing their beer cans all over. It's gonna be full of college kids, disruptive. I don't want them, right? So they're all thinking, we gotta preserve our neighborhood, and I'm willing to cough up 300 bucks. So the problem is that it's 100,000 for the apartment builder and 86,000 from the house builder, but do we end up getting an efficient outcome by having the government step in with a law that says apartments aren't allowed? And so the question is, or the answer is, it was actually efficient in this case, because the estimated benefits to the household of 300 times the 100 residents is 30,000. 30,000 plus 86,000 gave us 116,000 worth of benefit, which means it was good to keep the apartment building out of there, right? And then the zoning that forced the issue ended up having the efficient outcome. Does that make sense? So it's like the externality of the the noise and the beer cans and the college kids partying and stuff ended up being reflected through the policy of the zoning so it worked this time it doesn't always work that way but the point the author's bringing up it, it that it would be efficient in this case if this is the way the numbers were so kind of society's benefits of the private houses plus the their willingness to to buy off the externality. This is really the benefit that they get from not having another apartment there, right? So now that law, the zoning law, is capturing that. Does that make sense? Maybe before we continue on um, with this one, this is the video that, or the, uh, the one that you had to do the recording. Let me try to hit a couple of the highlights. Since we didn't get to have discussion, maybe you guys can ask if you had any questions after you watch the video. For this one, I just wanted to give a little extra information on what the heck's a hectare, right? And so one hectare is actually bigger than a soccer field, and one acre is a half of a soccer field. So just to kind of visually get it and for the most part for this class it doesn't really matter how you know we don't get into the square feet but an acre is 48,040 a square mile a square acre this is in terms of square feet so um, how big is the average house well maybe the average house occupies a couple thousand square feet well if they're on an acre lot that would be pretty big 
So most of the lots in Ottawa, probably the average would be around seven to 10,000 square feet, I would say somewhere in that. So you usually have most houses in average communities in the United States are sitting on about a quarter of an acre, roughly. Uh, and sometimes that might be a little less than a quarter of an acre. So conceptually, that's what we're thinking when we um, do some of this stuff. And then all these issues of density comes in. How many people, how many households, with smaller lot sizes, then I can have more density in a given acre, right? So those are some of the issues that we're bringing up in this class on, on developing um, real estate in this particular section. All right, any questions on that? All right, um, so this is all about zoning, you know, over the years, Houston, uh, is Julian gone again? He's not just a little kick in the butt, I think. Julian, if you're listening to this recording, get to class. All right, Julian lives in Houston, if you guys remember. Houston has been known over the years for having the least amount of zoning standards. And so I would have liked to get got, uh, Julian's comments on what does that mean? Well, usually what it means is if you're driving down the road, there's a trailer, there's a grocery store, and there's a house, right? Like on the same block, like they don't do what we're talking about in this particular section so for the most part now there's a lot of freedom right so that would be Houston is more free in terms of what do you want to do with your land you can do whatever you want to do right the government doesn't have any rules or restrictions for the most part or or they're a lot less than some other places around the country that's not true in most municipalities um, the city government the central planners of the city get together and through discussion and voting and community input and all of that, come up with laws to say, this is the residential area, this is the industrial area, right? So here in Ottawa on the north side and the south side, we've got, we've got some industrial stuff, the commercial area, the south side of Ottawa. So a lot of that was actually planned through city planning. And so what this chapter is questioning on with us is that does the, outcomes that come about from deliberation, community participation, listen to the households, listen to the businesses, have elected officials go through that whole process of voting. The outcome that comes out, is that good or does it suck, right? So the economist is now gonna look, is that an efficient way to do it or do we have better ways to do it? Okay, did I see a hand up or comment question? Yeah, Carlos? Yeah, so if they designate the industrial area, the household area, but if we let the free market go, it's not gonna be the same, or the household is gonna go together, the industrial is gonna- In go some, the, they will if it's to a monetary benefit usually, right? So, and, the, and there could be housing subdivisions that they know that people like golf courses, let's say. So, a developer, maybe in a free market, right, with no, let's just say Houston or something, they take 24 hectares and do a housing development that's golf. Why did they do it? Because they know if they didn't allow a trailer and a grocery store to be right next to another house, that the value of those lots would be higher. So I th is that kind of what you're yeah. getting at? Yeah, so the, the free market response could be satisfactory, but also then if you have, um, if, if you don't have that kind of coordination going on, then we get with kind of the hodgepodge of, well, there's a piece of land and we should put up a grocery store or a strip club or something. Let's just put it up here, right? And then there's no regulations on the strip club being right next to the, to the school, to the elementary school. Maybe we don't like that in our culture for some reason, right? So that is the, the types of things that, so it, it's, a, it's an interesting coordination issue. I, I mean, as free market of a guy as I am, I, I think that type of planning is helpful um, in, in most cases and that we do get a positive result, but we might not always get a positive result because um, a lot of times what happens is, and this happened up in Ames where I was doing real estate development, uh, the city planners say, oh, we gotta grow to the south because the fire station is there and the roads are there and we have better infrastructure. We're not gonna grow to the north well, everybody kind of wanted to grow to the north. And so there was this tension of like, should we, is it better to let the market say where, the, how, where and how the city wants to grow? Or are the central planners that knowledgeable that that's worth you know, the offset of it? 
Um, so interesting you know, issues come up with kind of the collective action problem with cities, and that's what makes it interesting. OK, anybody else? OK, so uh, here is Ottawa. And I thought I had this able to zoom out, but maybe I don't. Um, so this is a typical zoning map. And these are the different types of designations. So we have different types of residential, R1, low density, medium density, high density, so your big apartment buildings. Medium density might allow like duplexes and threeplexes. It depends on city to city, it could vary. And then usually the low density is single family houses only. And sometimes it'll be single family and duplex. Again, it just depends on the city. That's why if you're a real estate developer coming to Ottawa, you gotta know this map. Right? Like, where do I want to do stuff? Or if I want to uh, open up, uh, if I want to open up a, run up a strip club for some reason, but if I want to do that, is that even allowed? Right? Can anybody open up uh, that type of establishment? Well, there's, there'll be city zoning codes that say something along the lines of, no, it's not allowed, or yes, you can. Or it has to be outside city limits. So here's the city, the corporate city boundary. Um, and so your strip club can go right here but it can't be inside that, right? So there'll be laws on the land of different types of uses. Mobile home parks, mixed use would be kind of downtown area where you got commercial and residential mixed together. So a lot of times we keep that stuff separated, but especially in historic downtowns, that was pretty common back in the day to have that. And you guys have probably seen pedestrian malls, brand new mall type places that have housing intentionally, brand new construction, right? Like. Uh, that has um, uh, basically kind of a commercial area with living above. That's not 100 years old. That's, that was just built in the last 10 years. So that's a mixed use district. And then office space, commercial districts, blah, 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 all the way down. So that is a zoning map. And that's kind of the process that goes down. OK. Um, Let's see, this was some stuff on lot size, just some uh, rules of thumb. This was with uh, setting the tax rates, which some of your problems had. So I'll just mention it here, and then we can, we can spend a little more time on your questions as we get there. But um, when the city is establishing a budget for police and schools and health or whatever, all the projects that they have, they come up with ten million dollars so they set how much they want to spend and then they say well what's the value of the real estate in Ottawa and McCullough has a two hundred thousand dollar house value and next door his neighbor has a hundred and seventy five thousand dollar house value and so on and so on and so on and all the commercial stuff and we add up all of the value of real estate that's supposed to reflect the market value of real estate and then we say, oh, we want to raise 10 million for police and education and funding. Then it's just going to be 10 million, or uh, the uh, ratio of the, the number of the lot value divided by the 10 million gives me the percentage I need to charge. I need to charge 3% property tax to collect $10 million from all the value of the property in Ottawa. That's how property taxes get set. And so that's kind of what they run you through here. Any questions on that? Hopefully if you watched the video and you did your homework and stuff, this is just kind of a quick little review. Okay. Um, all right, so then we had the zoning <coughs> controls, which I think you guys had a problem on. So we had the bid rent curve that was kind of similar to what we had from the center. And then this is eventually how they get into uh, boundaries. So an urban growth boundary is set at eight miles. On that map, did I, did you get that red line that I think I was highlighting was the urban growth boundary. So they kind of set that up to say, this is where we foresee the city growing, which means you can't currently build outside of that boundary or wherever those lines are. And so it creates kind of a hard line. As development occurs, there might be people willing to spend money on that, but they can't because of the law, because of where the boundary is. So that's some of the issues that they're, they're looking at here. So we have an eight mile boundary, and that uh, increases the rent uh, because of the limited supply. 
And so that was the shift up here, right at the break point. This would have been the normal one, but since we have this growth boundary, it kind of limits the supply. It's like shifting the supply curve back to the left, and it's going to raise the prices. Okay, so what do we do? This is taxes equalizing. If uh, Was this pollution, or what did they do here? So it was similar to the model we had before, where if a city does regulations or taxes, if they increase their property taxes, then our utility is going to either go up or down, but ultimately then people vote with their feet and utility equalizes. So the same result that we got before. Okay, so here's supply and demand with the limited number of building permits again. So if the supply curve goes vertical, this is the way a quota worked in principles class. So we're going to restrict the number of houses. We don't want to grow too fast. Oh, the, there's people coming into our, um, into our city that we don't like. And so we're going to limit the number of permits and that causes the supply curve to go vertical here and raises the price of housing. So you want affordable housing, but then you limit the number of permits, and so you're talking out of one side of your mouth and the other at the same time, which a lot of cities do. Carlos? The, ver the vertical line is like uh, supply curve number two? Yeah, like number two. Yeah. So this would be what the supply curve would look like without any restrictions. And so then, oh, the city's growing too fast, and. Uh, we need to slow down development because it's changing our city. All of those migrants are coming into our town and ruining our city or something like that. So then they put some sort of growth restriction. It raises the price. The migrants are possibly lower income. And so now they can't afford to live here. And I'm giving you like a 30,000 foot, right? There's all kinds of details in between there. But they, conceptually, that's part of what goes on. So they might say... Um, you know, some bureaucrats that are trying to put uh, a, a positive spin on it, right? So you're talking about politicians. Oh, yes, well, we should, we should limit the supply. You know, we want to maintain the integrity of our town and, and the downtown area. And we don't want Walmart coming in and, you know, that sort of stuff. So. Okay. So this got into a little details. These were studies that were done that showed how much higher. I think this is kind of interesting with the, with the pricing um, per unit. And this was the premium of how much more money uh, some of these uh, places are doing. So uh, I can't remember. I got some Californians in here. Mackenzie. Oh, yeah. Tell you guys. So you go to L.A. especially, but it's kind of all over. How tall are the buildings? Like if you look in a, you drive through the neighborhoods of Los Angeles County and all over, are they, do you see lots of skyscraper buildings? Or not so much. And I'm talking about getting outside of the downtown. The downtown has skyscrapers, but no. If you go out, it's all kind of three-story buildings at most, right? So those are due to building restrictions. So California is so freaking expensive, well why? because the city has forced it to be that way through restricting building. You go to other cities like Miami, and how tall are those condominium buildings? About as far as the eye can see, right? So you've got this much land that has it. You're telling me people wouldn't like to look over the Pacific Ocean off the beaches of California? That they wouldn't pay buco dollars to be 54 stories in the air? Of course they would. California would look just like Miami in multiple places. Now, does that change the scenery and the culture? I don't know, but I'm just telling you, the consequence of that is this. San Francisco is 115,000. You go buy a house that's a normal house here in Ottawa for 160,000, it's probably 1.6 million in California. Why? Because they didn't allow people to build uh, more dense areas through zoning, which is this chapter. Okay, and here's some of the things that governments have done oversized, minimum lot size, builders requiring open space. We talked about that one before. All of those are, are things that have been done. Okay, so here, this kind of a similar picture with housing regulations tilting the supply curve up, whereas the regular supply curve would be here. 
prices would be lower. All right, so that's that. This is just extra stuff here. That's where I was going to add. All right, so now back to our problem. Suppose the Neighborhood Association stages a campaign of voluntary contributions in an attempt to outbid the apartment builder, an outcome under which each household contributes half of its benefit. And so what was the answer? It was not. It is not a Nash equilibrium, and why? It's a free rider problem. Okay, so we've got the free rider problem. So people are going to be able to enjoy the benefit without paying for it, and therefore you won't ultimately collect enough uh, payments to have that be a viable solution with contributing. Any questions there? And then this one, I think the answer was a little bit um, hard to digest. So suppose half of the households contribute and each household contributes some amount G. The campaign will generate the Pareto efficient outcome as a Nash equilibrium if G equals X. So what was the answer for this one? 280. 280. So we need G to be 280. And then what else did the answer key say? Because they are decisive. Because they are decisive. How did you guys interpret that? It's a pretty weak answer, so I wanted you guys to have more than just that. How so? Uh, the, so the 50 households will only pay that 280 both sides of the $100 or $100,000 for. Yeah, so let's let's hit the numbers here. We can we can kind of work it backwards. So 280 is the amount, but it's only half of them, so it's times 50, yeah. right? So we got 50 households, and so what does this equal here? 14,000. 14,000. So. 14,000 is what ends up being the amount contributed. The amount that was bid by the developer was 86. So that puts us at 100. And so now, what do we think means by decisive? Okay, so they, they know they want the house, so that the house is the preferred end, right? And so who's decisive? What do they mean by decisive? Like, will we get there or not? So kind of randomly, we had half of the households contribute. They're like, oh, I'll do, I'll do 150, but we didn't get all the households. So now we're right at this 100,000 mark. And so what's going on with the decisiveness? Who's the decisive person? The people paying the 280. Is it the people paying the 280? Yes. How are we going to get to, because right now, if we did it, it's 100 versus 100, right? So it's 100 from here and 100 from here. What do we do, a coin flip or something? Or they're saying no. Because we've got a little bit of G here that will be decisive. What's the person who didn't contribute? What are they thinking right now at this moment? Maybe I should have contributed. Maybe I should have contributed. Maybe I still have the opportunity to contribute. If they do, knowing that they half the people contributed already, they're the marginal contributor. So why are they the decisive contributor? One more unit. One more unit, and do they have, what makes it a Nash equilibrium versus the free rider is, do they have incentive to make that last con contribution? Yes, why? Okay, so the so how much so if they pay 280 but they get 
they get 300. And so now their private benefit is the deciding factor and it makes it happen. I spend 280 or even less, by the way, right? I could spend less, I could spend a dollar if it's a tie ball game. In theory, I could spend a dollar and get uh, the 300 worth of benefit. So the marginal, the private marginal cost benefit for the extra person is right at the margin where they would want to do it. And then, and then we're kind of home free as long as one of those people who hadn't contributed does. Okay, questions or comments there? Did that answer everything for whoever asked this question? Okay, somebody wanted to do three. Who wanted to do three? And there might have been a couple hands. Okay, so multiple people. Who pays a development tax? So consider a city where the initial equilibrium price of housing, new housing is 200,000. The price elasticity of demand for housing is uh, negative one. The long run price elasticity is four. Suppose the city imposes a development tax of 25,000 per dwelling. Illustrate the effects of the development tax on housing market. Include numbers for housing prices with and without the tax and the marginal cost of production uh, with and without the tax. The portion of the tax not borne by the consumers is borne by who? All right, so we got a little tax one. Okay, so what do you have for answers? Like the the author's answers. Uh, P one equals two hundred thousand. P two equals two hundred twenty thousand. Okay, and then some of the other details. We had a short run elasticity of negative point one or one, I said 1.0 I guess, and what was the other one, four? Long run price elasticity, and the long run price elasticity of supply, so the elasticity of supply was four. Okay, so how'd you do it? Oh, and then what was the proportion of the tax not borne by the consumers is borne by Landowners. Landowners is that. So kind of a tax burden question here. It gave us marginal cost to you. Yeah, what was that? Marginal cost one is two hundred thousand. Marginal cost two is one ninety five. Marginal cost one is two hundred thousand. Two hundred? Two hundred thousand. Okay. And the second one is one ninety five. <laughs> one ninety five. All right, so what did you guys do for this one? So we, 200,000 P1 was given to us. And so the question is, what is happening with these costs? And then we have the tax, I guess we could throw the tax up there, of 25,000, and that's per dwelling. Per house. How do we get the 220? Who's ready, Jonathan? Well, it said that the landowners are take some portion of the tax, so. I just said that they took 5,000 of the 25,000. Now, did they take it or how do we, how do we get that? So, if we were to do a supply and demand deal, which you guys should be thinking when you see the tax, which one's relatively flatter, the supply or the demand? Supply. Supply, why? Has a higher elasticity. Has a higher elasticity. And this one we always go in absolute value, right? In terms of judging the flatness or steepness 
the responsiveness to quantity demand. So we never want to forget we got percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price, and four is the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. Sorry, not demanded, this is supply. So this is the responsiveness to suppliers. So how would you interpret four? Russ McCullough bonus question that you should know for the final exam. How would you interpret an el a supply elasticity of four? Carlos. And for one more dollar change in price, we will have four more units. No, you're close. You did the four and the one right, but you didn't use the right uh, measurements. Let me go to Bryce. Oh, change price, we need to a 4% what type of change? Increase. Increase, yes. So all you missed was the percent. So follow, follow what this is saying. So 4 over 1. So the 1 goes with the percent. A 1% increase in price leads to a 4% increase, since this is a positive number in quantity supplied. Same thing up here. A 1% increase in price leads to a 1% decrease in quantity demand. So that was our interpretation that we've done a thousand times uh, in this class alone. But you got to have that burned in. So I want you guys to have, all of you should have that right off the tip of your tongue when we talk about interpreting and elasticity. Okay, so since the supply is flatter, they have a bigger response. And demand, something like that. And so what is the initial price? 200,000. 200, All right, and I don't think we had a quantity, did we? I don't think we were messing around with quantity, if I remember right. Okay, so now we implement a tax. What happens to the picture? With a tax, back to principles class. It's gonna be a a vertical line on the left side. Okay, vertical line, so we can show it with thinking about the tax being charged to the uh, developer, the landowner, right? So it shifts up by the amount of the tax of 25,000. You could actually tax the, uh, the consumer too. Uh, that would be another possibility by that amount. So it doesn't actually matter who you tax, is what we did in principles class. The burden of the tax is going to be borne by both parties, as long as there's some slope to each uh, party's curve in this case. All right, so um, if we're zapping the landowner here with a tax of $25,000, Again, you can kind of think about that as a supply curve with the tax, maybe shifting up. And so then we're trying to figure out what this number is, which the answer key told us is 220,000. And then what's this number? 195. 195. So we have to kind of compute this stuff, though that wasn't given to us as part of the original set of conditions. But the elasticities were given to us, the 200,000 was given to us, the $25,000, and then we have to kind of figure out the rest of it. All right. Um, so how do we do this? Without using the answer key, how the heck would you solve for this one? Yeah? Would you, so you use your the elasticity equations and the change of price would be the 200,000 plus the 25,000. You do that for both uh, demand and supply to get the new prices <coughs> for the missing prices. Um, so how, how are you getting the 25? Or how, you're adding? Or I guess like what I'm looking for is like a percent increase and use that percent increase to um, yeah. find the new. That's what you need to do with this problem. But there's one little formula that's not always easy to remember. Did anybody figure it out? And it, I can't remember if your book actually had it in there or not with the burden of fractions of tax. It's in here somewhere. It might be some of the early material we had with the elasticities. Did you add the elasticities? Add the elasticities. That would give you five. Yeah. And what else? Five by the change in the demand. 
Changing the max supply over the total less than teams? Um, there's a way to do it with just the fractions. And I think that's where they take this problem. So I think it's probably at the beginning of the book. And it is the tax shares. So if we do the share as the elasticity of demand over the sum of the elasticities, what is this number equal? What was the elasticity of demand? One. And what's this? Five. Five. So one fifth of twenty-five thousand is five thousand. So if we do the elasticity of supply over the sum of the elasticities, we get four fifths. Now, what's kind of uh, non-intuitive about this is that who paid the fifth? The buyer, the demanders, or the suppliers? The suppliers. The suppliers, right? So the fifth is the 5,000, so the 195 is here. And that is the suppliers. And the demand, the price that consumers pay, was up here. So that was the 220. So you pretty much had to know this formula for this particular problem. And I couldn't remember if they had it in there or not, but it's under, I think it's maybe back in chapter two, like those introductory chapters, they might have had some, something in there with that. <laughs> okay, so notice that this is the supply share by putting the, that's the counterintuitive one. The supplier's share is putting the elasticity of demand divided by it. And then the elasticity of supply is really the demand share. And then I guess that's what part uh, part of this question asks with who's the portion of the tax not borne by the consumers and is borne by the producers. Okay, any last things on that one? Yeah, Carlos? I didn't get a little bit to $20,000. Oh, uh, four-fifths. Four-fifths of the tax. So if we... The, the tax burden does like this. This vertical height is 25,000, right? So that's the amount of the tax. And then we used to pay 200 before the tax was put into place. And so the upper portion of this tax burden, the tax revenue is the whole box, by the way, is the tax revenue. This is the quantity after the tax. So the government is going to collect the orange box of 25,000 times QT. But the upper part of the box is showing the uh, consumer's burden. And then the lower part of the box is the producer burden. And so it's four-fifths of 25,000 is 20,000. Okay, anything else on this chapter? All right, let's talk congestion. Traffic control, chapter 18. All right, so kind of a fun chapter. By the way, how much of this uh, course do we have left? Two weeks. Two weeks, like less than two weeks. Just wanted to make sure you guys are aware of that. Do we have a paper? We have a paper. 
That'll be due Sunday after we're done with class, so you can work on it early if you want, but Sunday will be the, the paper due date, because I certainly am not going to read them any sooner than that, so I'll let you guys have it through Sunday. Um, and the final exam will be Friday in class. So. All right, so here's the uh, idea of traffic that we touched on a little bit here on the externality of congestion. And so now we're going to start to model some of the details of that. The chapter starts off talking um, about what is the current use empirically of, of roads? What are people doing it? So uh, share of travel, the percent of cars on the road, social and recreational, 30%. To and from work, commuting, 19%. Personal business, family business, shopping, work-related, school and church, and then other. So this kind of gives us a pie chart of why are people out on the road? Well, a lot of it is just social and recreational as most of the miles. When they're traveling though, what distance are they going? So that type of travel, 11 miles. Uh, Work-related business. So if we're doing uh, the commute to, uh, to work, to and from work is 12 miles. So we're looking at the distances traveled through survey data of what people are doing. And of course now with today's GPS technology and all of that stuff, we can, we can even get that down a little tighter than, than what we would in the past through survey data. Okay, so how are people driving places by themselves? That's why we have congestion. People aren't gonna carpool if they don't have to in America. We're rich. Go to a developing country, guess what they do? They pile into small cars. There will be six to eight people in a four-seater uh, compact car. So we're rich in America, and so we want our car. In fact, we have two cars, and we only need one, but we have two anyway, because sometimes I want to drive my truck, and sometimes I want to drive my Jag. And that's just the way it is. And when I go somewhere, I go alone 75% of the time. Carpooling, public transit, walking, work alone. So that is the the snapshot of America and driving. And then how has that changed over time? So we got uh, commuting distance, time, and speed. So this is length, time, and speed. And so length in miles, we're driving more from 1983 to 2001. 83 to 2001 with time, we're spending more time on the road. And 83 to 2001, we're driving even a little bit slower than what we did in 1990. So I don't know why that is. I suspect it's possibly uh, restrictions on speed, right? So we killed some kids back here that were running around the, uh, the playground in the elementary school. So we put up 20 miles an hour and we put big flashing lights and police cars are there to say, slow down, right? And so apparently that had an effect of slowing down traffic by a couple miles an hour. So we got that going for us. All right. So how can we measure the cost of congestion? So now that we have all this data, we can look at the average person spending 47 hours a year in traffic. When they're sitting there idling in traffic, there's extra gas and fuel being used to the tune of five billion, if we take all of the drivers out there that are stuck in traffic. And so the sum of time and fuel, so we're, um, looking at $63 billion of maybe waste or cost due to congestion. So we'll start to model that. We'll say that our commuting distance is 10 miles, which falls in line, what was it, 11 on that, that research study? So we're trying to put, build a model that's reflecting some of the empirical data. Uh, monetary cost of 20 cents a mile, so we can look at wear and tear on my tires and the oil and whatever, so all of that stuff can be taken into account. And then your time cost, uh, making an assumption of 10 cents per mile. All right, so here's our standard externality graph. So not all of you had this exact same setup in principles class. So let's kind of work through what the problem is with externalities. Here is me privately thinking about the cost of a trip. So I need to get somewhere, so I have a benefit of driving somewhere, but I have to drive my car and it costs me. 
individually, privately, that amount. So making my private decision, cost-benefit analysis for me, this is what we're gonna do. This is what everybody does. However, I don't take into account the fact that I'm adding an incremental little tiny bit of congestion to the road when I do it. And so I end up uh, putting a cost out to other people, that external cost, and when enough people do it at the same time, we have a social cost that's higher than our, our private cost or an unrecognized private cost that I didn't take into account when I jumped on the road. And so the efficient amount of vehicles on the road uh, getting away from the congestion would be 1,400 uh, vehicles on the road at that time. Okay, so what's this triangle area a lot of times when we do these graphs? Dead weight loss. So one thing to highlight for you is that when you have an externality, and normally this is, this is the, our, our startup of that, is that the government comes in and the quantity changes, they impose a tax, and the government creates a dead weight loss, right? The government policy created waste um, that we benefit that we had when the government wasn't involved because of the thing that, the, of what they did. With an externality, the free market has a dead weight loss already because of the externality. And so this triangle area is a dead weight loss that maybe we can try to get rid of. And so here it says the net gain from a congestion tax. If I now set the tax equal to the amount of the externality, $2.10, QT becomes 1400 So I'm going to put a tax together that causes the quantity to fall from 1600 to 1400 and that will then eliminate the dead weight loss. I see a couple blank stares. I see a couple nods. So let me go back. Free market. Free people, free people, they have 100 units. Yay, yay Adam Smith, yay free market. Boo government, coming in and screwing things up, making 80, creating a dead weight loss. Over here, I hate that this even hurts me to say this, but boo free market because free people are not taking into account their externality that they're creating with congestion. Does that make sense? So their private choices aren't taking into account the other harm that they're doing to other people. So it's kind of a little small boo free market. And then this one, I can't even say this. So yay government, so <laughs> delete that. Um, government comes in and fixes the problem with the tax. The reason that that's BS is that we still have, what is the government doing with this money? Um, do they really know the amount of the exact tax to set to hit it perfectly? No. So there's a lot of problems with that. Um, and so now some other solutions might be to have a toll or a cost that every American pretty much is going to hate, but we use our GPS to say, all of y'all are gonna pay a dollar per mile if you drive between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. during rush hour. You can still use the road, but if you use the road during 4 p.m. and 6 p.m., you're gonna have to pay a buck. So now that system is a lot more efficient than the government doing this and trying to estimate. Why? Because now people are gonna take into account, is it worth it for me to pay the extra buck a mile? Yes, I'm going to be late for daycare. The daycare people, if I'm 15 minutes late, it is uh, five bucks a minute, and I can't afford that, so I'm going to easily pay the extra buck to jump on the freeway to use it during the hours of 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., right? And so now that calculus is all in there compared to the, to the uh, person who's like, ah, I think I'll go home. I could go home at five or I could go home at six. Uh, I think I'll go home at five today, but I don't really care. 
you know, sometimes I enjoy being stuck in traffic because then I can listen to my podcast longer, right? And so it's like, well, what, what, we'd rather have that person who doesn't care about time having a choice to go at six outside of the rush hour time rather than inside. How can we do that? We charge them an extra buck. And then maybe they don't care then. And then they listen to their podcast at, at work or something or find other arrangements. Does that make sense? How we can design things differently um, and we don't have to rely on, on the government to solve the problem there. But nonetheless, we have to kind of go through this, this tax idea. All right, so here, there's a lot of things going on here. So let's kind of unpack this. Off to the left, column A is the volume of vehicles per lane. So that if you, I think we did this before, a few of you have driven in like LA traffic, five lanes, solid, jam-packed, stop and go in five lane traffic, it sucks. Well, they measure that stuff. And so here, um, when we're down at 200, notice the externality is zero. Even at 400, the externality is zero. Traffic's moving at a, a normal pace, right? So the, the, the highway can absorb traffic quite a bit, even up here to 600, we start to kick in a little bit. But then we start to get to stop and go land here, right? And now the externality, the amount of time increased is 14 minutes, 21 minutes, 36 minutes. So they, they can measure that stuff. And now we can put dollars to that time wasted and ultimately that's where, where we fill in the rest of the chart. So column B is the trip time. So the trip is gonna go with more uh, people added to the road. The private trip cost, $2 monetary cost, 10 cents per minute times the trip time. Increase in time per vehicle, increase in total travel time. So this is D times the number of vehicles. The external trip cost, of the 10 cents per minute, and then the social trip cost is adding it together. Okay, so all we're doing is we're constructing the supply and demand stuff, right? That's essentially what we're doing is trying to estimate, well, what are these external costs in estimating what they are? And so that brings us back to this, to this picture where at 1600 level of traffic, we got $7.21 at 1600. So if I go back here, at 1600, I had $7.21. So all we're doing is mapping out these social costs and private costs, and that's where this picture is coming from. Okay, questions or comments there? All right, so. Is the tax worth it? So in theory, we have a reduction of other taxes. That doesn't happen in the real world. So the government gets this idea of, I know, we'll, we'll tax gas, right? We'll tax gasoline, and then that will keep people from driving so much. Well, in theory, they might say, let's tax gas and, and then lower the income tax. But when reality hits, they get the money in and they're like, oh, this is pretty cool, let's, let's just keep the money. I, I've got lots of good things, public programs uh, that we can do. We can build bridges and, and libraries and, and schools. And so that's why I put the in theory there. That, that doesn't always happen. All right, so we can use consumer and producer surplus um, to think about uh, these issues as well. So what is going on here? with each person. So we got Hiram and Lois. And so we have a, a tax involved. So Lois stops using the road with the tax. How much tax paid, decrease in cost, lower income tax, net benefit. So in theory, this would be the central planner moving the shells around to say we could do this and it would be a, a net benefit to society. Uh, keeping Lois off the road, and then Hiram ends up paying the taxes, and now we've got the person who wants to be on the road, on the road paying for it, and the other person having a benefit through some less uh, income tax paid. All right, 
So will the imposition of a congestion tax cause the city to grow or shrink? So what's the things going on there? Will the imposition of a congestion tax cause the city to grow or shrink? Think back to our previous chapters about why cities grow or shrink. Bryce? It would be growth. It would grow because people who are willing to pay the dollars to use it can travel faster, which increases their utility, and the people who don't want to pay the dollars Okay. Yeah, if we can set it up on the user basis, that, that might cause to grow. Not to mention there's probably a higher willingness to pay for public transportation due to the tax. Okay, so it could shift into other, there might be other alternatives. So yeah, it, it could definitely um, you know, change. Taxes in general would be bad from our models, uh, but if there's enough congestion offsetting, congestion benefit, so here's the utility model. So will it cause, so if we have the initial utility in two cities are equal, and then one city adopts the toll roads or the congestion tax. So they jump up to J, but then look at what happens. What happens to the city that didn't do the congestion problem? They shrink or grow? They shrink. They shrink. Remember, the initial utility is where we started. We had two identical cities to start with, and then the one city did the utility, and it was kind of Bryce's uh, thoughts that, oh, well, that's better. If there's uh, less congestion, it'll make it happier. Um, and so that was the shift up. But then what happens over time? The city who didn't do it shrinks or grows? Shrinks. What happens to congestion when they shrink? It goes down. So their utility goes up, but then where did those people go? They're gonna come back over to here, causing more congestion, but they've got the tax thing offsetting it. But ultimately at the end of the day, both cities are happier. So we end up at 77 instead of 70, even when one city does the adoption of the policy. Okay, so, um, perfect. Yeah, we'll pick up there on Thursday. Um, let me see, we're at 1131. Yeah, that'll be good. Let's, um, I can't remember if I put this in the announcements or not, but let's do a triumph chapter for Thursday discussion. Six. Yeah, before class 1130, chapter six, I think it is, right? Yeah. Ron? Whatever the next one is. I think it's six. I think we talked about five, didn't we? Or?